This is America on the Road, winner of the International Automotive Media Conference Gold Medal Award for Radio, and now in its 26th year on the air. Thanks for being with us as we bring you the latest automotive information from around the world. These days, both new and used cars are, have suddenly gotten much more expensive as inflation is gripping the nation, but one group is doing quite well in this new environment, and we'll have the details on that. Meanwhile, Acura is trying to shake things up by bringing back one of its most familiar nameplates. Much more on that coming up, too. America on the Road is brought to you by Mercury Insurance and DrivingToday.com. If you're looking to save some money, you should switch to Mercury for your auto and home insurance. Californians save an average of $670 with Mercury. So imagine how much you could save. Get a quote today at MercuryInsurance.com. Hi, I'm Jack D. Rad. With me is co-host Chris Teague. Chris lives at one end of the country. I live at the other. Each week we get together to talk about cars, something we are very passionate about. And Chris, you have a change in the car household at the Teague residence. Tell us about that. It's kind of cool. It is. Uh, so we talked a few times. I bought a, an old Porsche Cayenne a few, I guess, a few months ago now. And, you know, with the supply chain the way it is, the repairs that it needed weren't so large that it was impossible to drive, but it was just impossible to find the parts. So it sat in the shop for three months until I actually needed to use it and then decided that I was just going to get rid of it. So I uh, sent it away and and pulled in with a 2022 Volkswagen Golf GTI uh, on Friday. Um, just leasing it, didn't buy it, but uh, very happy with it so far, even though uh, slim pickings on dealer lots these days. Wow, interesting. And a, a new vehicle. I didn't realize that. I know you had a, a new-to-you car, but it's also a, a new-to-everybody car. So that's, that's very cool. Good for you. Yeah, with the new dog, I decided I'd rather have him destroy a car that I'm responsible for rather than a manufacturer's loaner car. So it just made sense to have a vehicle to drive uh, every day that I don't have to worry about so much. Yeah, well, I think manufacturers will be happy with that. We have a special guest this week. Her name is Marina Angelides, and she is the chief financial officer for a company called Automotive Mastermind. We've interviewed some of their folks before. She's an expert on the intersection between the car buyer and the car dealer, something Chris <laughs> just uh, experienced. And so she'll help us understand this crazy market, as Chris will. In the road test segment, Chris, what vehicle do you have for us this week? I was driving the 2022 Infiniti QX80, Jack. It's a full-size luxury SUV with plenty of great features and quite a few quirks as well. Quirks. I like that. Well, I can't wait to hear about that. I was driving the 2022 Ford Mustang, a Mach 1, so we'll talk about that. We, uh, we don't have to explain that all that much until we get to the road test segment. Uh, before we do that, we'll have some auto-related news from around the world, so stay with us for that. That's coming up next right here on America on the Road. Stay with us. Welcome back to America on the Road with Christine Jackie Red back with you. And it is news time. And wow, do we have some news for you. I took a trip to the J.D. Power Auto Summit uh, very recently. And uh, a lot of information gleaned from that. I, I learned a lot. I was really glad I attended that. And here's some of the things I'd like to share with you because... We teased there is a group that is loving the current environment uh, in, the, uh, in the auto sales department, and I'll tell you who it is. It's car dealers. They're digging this. <laughs> there is Their uh, gross profit per vehicle, according to J.D. Power figures, is up 250%. 250%, Chris. I, maybe you contributed to that with your new vehicle lease. Uh, but uh, very, very profitable for them. 65% of sales right now are over suggested retail price. Think of that, 65%. And uh, here's something interesting for you, too, as uh, someone who has just leased, Chris, the leasing mix is down from 31% to 19% over the last three years. It's really interesting, and that's going to have some ramifications. Uh, what was your experience? Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. I started my shopping uh, trip or journey or whatever you want to call it, shopping for a Golf R, the top of the line Volkswagen Golf. Uh, I started trying to order one. There were no orders being taken at this point in time and zero cars within like a 300-mile drive. I found three dealers with a car and they were all marked up at least $10,000. And I was told that uh, the markups were necessary because they just didn't have enough vehicles to sell and they felt like they needed to make the money that they could on the cars that they had. Uh, the GTI that I found was at retail price, MSRP. However, it was only at MSRP because someone had ordered it and then backed away from the sale at the last minute. So I was able to swoop in and take it. But, uh, you know, I think that 
<laughs> you know, regardless of whether they need to, whether they need the markups or not, uh, I think that you know those are tough pills to swallow for a lot of people. I think there's tough pill, uh, pills to swallow, but at the same time, you don't have to buy or lease a vehicle. You can uh, stay out of the marketplace. You know, some people absolutely need one. I don't know that they absolutely need a new car, however. Uh, and I can understand what's going on with the dealerships because what's happening is they don't have inventory to sell. That's why the prices are what they are. And it's difficult in terms of overall profits. Uh, you know, profits per, per vehicle are way, way up. And profits are up too because uh, they don't have to compete nearly as much. People are just waiting for cars and are willing to pay list price or above. But at the same time, there are some difficulties for the dealer who's used to having a ton of uh, inventory and giving people a wide variety of choices. And now, uh, as you experience, there's very little out there. Yeah, you know, some automakers, I think Ford is one that are they're encouraging folks to directly order their vehicles as opposed to showing up and just trying to find one on a dealer's lot. You know, it, it really is hit or miss here in Maine, and I'm sure you have a lot. In fact, I know you have a lot more car dealerships where you are than we do. But uh, some dealers, like the Volvo dealer down the street here, has plenty of inventory. Uh, but you go two doors down to the Nissan dealership, and their their new car lot is full of used cars. So uh, it's really interesting to see how that breaks down between brands as well. Yeah, absolutely true. Well, one of the things about the fewer leases being written right now is that there will be very uh, uh, many fewer lease vehicles coming back into the market as used cars in three years. And that's going to affect the used car market for uh, a long period of time. I mean, that's a fairly steady source of business for both the car dealer and people in the marketplace going, getting those three-year-old vehicles as they come off lease. And now there are going to be many, many fewer of those than there were before, uh, a large percentage uh, less than before. There's also uh, the loans are getting longer <laughs> uh, significantly longer to where 42% uh, of car loans now are 72 months long. That's one long car loan, and you're liable to be upside down for a, a significant portion of that loan. And 11% are 84 month loans these days. Those are really, really uh, lengthy loans. And well, uh, talk a bit about that, you know, what you think about uh, what's going on with these long loans, because they do have ramifications, don't they, Chris? Well, they do, yes. And as you mentioned, one of them, uh, one of the biggest, I guess, is, is if these people try to trade their vehicles in a few years down the road, they're going to find that they either don't have the equity that they thought they had in the vehicle, meaning uh, the difference between what they owe and what the vehicle is worth is smaller than what they thought, or they're just uh, way upside down, like you said, so they owe more than the car is worth and they can't trade it in. So then they're effectively stuck with it. You know, I guess for some people, if you have a car that you really love and you are going to drive it for that amount of time and take care of it, uh, maybe that would work out for you if you get a great interest rate. However, the interest rates tend to balloon the longer the the loan period. So, uh, you know, I think it it's a big risk, Jack, and I would never, uh, you know, uh, advocate that somebody take a six, seven-year loan, six-year loan. Uh, but I guess if you have to have a vehicle and you can only afford it that way, that might be the only way for some people to get it behind the wheel. Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways to get behind the wheel without going to a seven or <laughs> you know eight-year <laughs> loan or something like that. Uh, that are more palatable and just make uh, better economic sense. Here is one thing in, uh, I think, the buyer's favor, and that is the trade-in equity has gone up pretty significantly. It's essentially doubled, uh, more than doubled from 4200 So the average trade-in of a couple of years ago was $4,200. Now the average trade-in is worth close to 9000 or over $9,000, $9,300, almost $9,400. So that's a big change. Uh, retail sales will be up. Retail car sales will be up for 2022, but largely only as far up as inventory will take them. You know, we've heard basically they're selling off the truck. The truck gets delivered and the car goes out. And that's what's happening. I mean, dealers are selling the cars that reach them, almost 100% of those that are turning them very, very rapidly. And it's a, a way different business than it has been really for, for the last you know, maybe 100 years. This is a real anomaly going on right now. It will be really interesting to see, as you mentioned earlier, you know, with the lease turn-ins impacting long-term uh, used vehicle availability, it'll be really interesting to see how this, if at all, changes the dealership model. You know, if the if there's no incentive to have a huge lot full of cars if they're being sold so quickly, or if people are ordering them, you know, straight out of the dealer's website and then are configuring them and buying them straight that way, uh, it'll be interesting to see, you know, if this shrinks the average dealer, you know, it makes them 
a little bit more compact and more agile. I, I just I would love to see how I wish I had a crystal ball to look three or four years down the road. Well, I, I'll gaze into mine and I will tell you that because <laughs> this uh, industry is so production driven and there generally is a way over production, there's a, a ability to produce a lot more cars than there are buyers. We're not seeing that now because of many restraints. Uh, supply chain problems and uh, chip shortages and those kind of things, but overall we're going to see we're going to go back to an overproduction kind of situation. Um, the big car companies are not as agile as dealers are, and they are not going to be able to uh, get rid of all the production facilities uh, they have. So, um, at some future date, mark my words, this will change. It'll change to, kind of back to what we saw before. I'm marking this down, Jack. I'm yeah, hold write, you to write it. that down. Hold me to <laughs> it. Hold me to it. Circle this date on the calendar. Well, I, I, another reason to circle this date on the calendar is that Acura is bringing back a nameplate that uh, many of us have uh, known and loved for years and years. How they ever let this go, I don't know. I guess they got into that uh, alphanumeric naming and, and let go of the Integra. But it is coming back and it's a, one of the, I think, prototypical sports compact cars. What's your take on the return of the Integra, Chris? I am excited. The Integra, the one of the original Integras, was the first car I drove with a manual transmission. Just so many great experiences in the, the older cars. The new car looks great. You know, I think some people would complain about the form factor, although that is a form factor that Acura has used in the past for the car. Uh, I think it looks great. The performance seems to be there. It shares a lot of the parts underneath the hood with the Honda Civic SI. So the turbocharged 1.5 liter four cylinder is at 200 horsepower, uh, limited slip differential. So it looks like it's got the goods to be quite a fun car. I'm really excited about it. I'm so glad to see this vehicle back and I think it's going to be really exciting. I agree. And you know, the, the, the Integra is just such a, an anomaly in today's world. And, you know, even the Civic SI, the small sp stick shift, uh, sports cars, sports sedans, uh, so, you know, I think we're not likely to see a ton more of them like this unless they're, you know, electrified without a manual transmission. But uh, the more, the better for now while we can still get them. Well, it's interesting you m mentioned the uh, manual transmission because that's certainly the way to go because the alternative is a CVT uh, with shift paddles to change gears that a CVT doesn't have. So, <laughs> you know, we will see how that sorts out. Maybe it'll be a lot better than I expect. And I'm hoping so. I'm, I'm really excited about this car. And uh, I'm really excited about the fact that Acura is bringing this back. So very, very cool. Absol absolutely agree. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about a big luxury SUV, the Infiniti uh, QX80. And, of course, the uh, Ford Mustang. You guys have heard of that, I think. Uh, so stay with us for that. We'll be right back right here on America on the Road. Welcome back to America on the Road with Chris Teague. This is Jack Red with you, and we're so glad you're with us for road test time and way different vehicles this time around. We have a big three-row luxury SUV and a, a sports car, or essentially a sports car. Sporty car is what they used to call them. I guess they're calling a, a Ford Mustang a sports car these days. But Chris, you were driving the Infiniti QX80. Tell us about that. I was driving the Infiniti QX80, Jack. It is essentially a... A nicer Nissan Armada, if you want to think about it that way. It's a full-size three-row SUV, luxury SUV, as we said. Uh, it comes with a 5.6 liter V8, producing around 400 horse, not around 400 horsepower, exactly 400 horsepower. Uh, it's paired with a seven-speed automatic transmission and either rear or four-wheel drive. Uh, so they start around $72,000 for the base Lux trim. I tested the sensory trim, which is the top model. It's just shy of $84,000. And Jack, before we go too far into this, I want to get your feeling about the price here. And we'll talk about value in just a minute. But $84,000, three-row full-size luxury SUV. How do you think it stacks up against the Lincoln Navigator, Cadillac Escalade, uh, all of which are a little bit more expensive at the top end? There are a lot of good competitors out there. But I think in a lot of ways, the QX80 is the bargain choice. Uh, there's a lot of It has a lot of good stuff. I don't know that it's leading edge stuff, but... Uh, I think it can compete with those others out there. I agree. And, you know, I think, so here's a, a couple of things about the QX80 that are really interesting. So it's a, a large SUV. It's very tall and very boxy, uh, just like the Armada, just like a lot of other full-size SUVs. The 5.6 liter V8, 400 horsepower, doesn't sound like a ton of power for uh, such a large vehicle, but uh, it's capable of moving this thing pretty quickly. Uh, you know, I think it's zero to 60 in under six seconds, which for a three-row uh, behemoth like this is is quite quite quick. 
Uh, it's got a nice V8 sound. It's a great muscular sound when you start it up, especially cold starts here in the morning. The ride is smooth. Inside, you get just enough hint of the V8 to let you know that you're driving something with a, a big powertrain in it, uh, but it is otherwise very quiet and serene. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the power is one thing. The ride is very comfortable as well, but it is not floaty. It's not like you're going to you feel like you're riding in a, a Buick from the 1970s or something like that. Um, it's it's pretty sharp uh, for such a large SUV, even though it's not, as I mentioned, uh, sporty in any way. Inside, the top trim that I tested has semi-aniline uh, quilted leather. It's really nice uh, brown sort of a chocolate color inside. Three rows of seating, as I said, Jack, and this is where we're going to talk about my height a little bit, and I'll get your opinion here, I too. I can't wait to hear it, and I have an opinion about your height, too, but I'll keep it to myself. Oh, uh, well, I'm six feet tall, and uh, with the second row captain's chairs that this uh, vehicle has, my two daughters riding now in car seats, I have a nine-year-old and a five-year-old, uh, both of them could stretch out, have absolutely no problem with, with leg room. My wife, who is just over five feet tall, also had no problem riding in the second row, uh, plenty of leg room there behind me in the driver's seat. The challenge here is with the third row seat, and I know we talk about this sometimes in vehicles, midsize SUVs like the Honda Pilot or the Toyota Highlander. Uh, they're e they're hard to access, and they're not that all, all that comfortable for adults. Uh, that's the same case here. The QX80 reaching the back row is a little tough. Once you're in there, uh, I wouldn't want to ride back there as an adult at six feet tall, as we know. Uh, for any any different any distance of time, and Jack, I don't know if you've been in the back of a three row SUV lately, but what are your thoughts on, you know, how useful these seats are for people who you know don't have families or may only occasionally need to use them? Well, I think there's a wide variety of accommodations back there. I think we talked about uh, the uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee uh, L uh, in a recent show, maybe it was even last week, and I think that has a pretty good uh, for adult uh, third row seat. Uh, it's it, Fairly accommodating. Others, not so much. And I, I think as, as you uh, go through these with a, the family that you have and you bring kids along, you know, bring friends of the kids along, uh, it's mostly going to be kids back there. It's going to be rare that you're going to have adults back there. So I think they serve a purpose for sure. I think the third row is, is useful. I agree. I think I will say I wish that many of them were more more easily accessible. But my wife's XC90 that we have, uh, the third row is plenty plenty of space for people to ride back there. But it's you know it's almost impossible to access without playing some sort of contortionist uh, uh, body movements to get back there. But in any case, uh, the inside of the QX80 lives up to the, the price tag. I think you know the semi aniline leather feels great. Uh, heated and cooled front seats, heated second row seats. Uh, the leather is soft. The interior is full of soft touch materials. The design is great. It looks nice. Visibility is good. Uh, there's a 12.3 inch touchscreen. It's got wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It's got a wireless device charging. I'll call it a cubby, which is kind of tucked into the dash. It's a little awkward to reach back there. And my top trim had a rear entertainment system with two screens, remotes, and Bluetooth and Bluetooth headphones for the kids, which they absolutely love. I think we only own like two DVDs at this point in time, but they work great. Um, you have to plug in the DVD player, but all good there. So overall, I think the interior here has a great design. I think it's pretty intuitive. I will say that, uh, you know, Infinity did a good job providing physical controls for a lot of things. However, the volume knob and the control for the the temperature of the climate settings are right next to each other or right on top of each other. And they're almost the same size. So I'm constantly like turning up the heat or turning down the heat, trying to adjust the radio volume and vice versa. Uh, and I think, you know, there's some other quirkiness with the infotainment. It's a little clunky at times. But overall, it's, you know, as you mentioned, it's a value pick. It's very comfortable. And I would recommend it uh, even against more expensive and, and probably better SUVs uh, from other brands. I like it, too. I think it is good value. And I, I think it's certainly worth a look. So look at that Infiniti QX80 and uh, see how you feel about it. Well, I was driving a vehicle that needs no introduction. That is the Ford Mustang. And it's amazing to me how Ford has just stuck with the formula that is now more than 60 years old. Can you believe that? More than 60 years old, but essentially the same. A highly styled two-door puts looks kind of a, and performance ahead of interior space and practicality. That was a big deal in the 60s, and uh, it's still a fairly big deal now. It's I have to scratch my head and wonder how long this will go on when we see this uh, kind of relic from the past uh, in this era of electric vehicles, uh, where the form factor of the vehicle changes or could change uh, very radically. But we'll, 
we'll see how that goes. I think a lot of people are still excited about Mustangs. I'm excited about driving the thing. And uh, I was excited this past week uh, driving the Ford Mustang Mach 1, one of the many choices out there. Uh, there isn't a ton of news for a Mustang for the 2022 model year, but they do have a bunch of uh, specialty models and I think when there's no big news out there, no big change in a model, they put together some special models. And, geez, there's more than a handful. It's kind of amazing <laughs> the number of limited edition models. There's the uh, GT500 Heritage Edition, the Ice White Edition Coupe, the California Special GT Performance Package, and the Coastal Limited Edition. And then there's a Stealth Edition. So all of that is coming uh, your way uh, from Mustang. I was driving uh, one of the top-level Mustangs. I guess the not the Shelby GT500, which is almost beyond Mustang, but the Mustang Mach 1. Uh, the base is at over $55,000, a lot of money, but is very sophisticated, really. It has Brembo six-piston front brake calipers, a bunch of different uh, an oil, a transmission, and a differential cooler. It has active dampers. That's uh, an important addition. Uh, very, very good suspension here. And it has the Tremec six-speed manual with rev matching is an important uh, thing. You can get it with a 10-speed automatic as well. And a lot of people will probably be better off with that. But there's something cool about that six-speed manual uh, with the rev matching that, that helps you with all that. This is a vehicle with immense performance potential immense performance potential the mach 1 has 470 horsepower from its 5 liter v8 engine this is a normally aspirated 5 liter v8 talk about old school with a 6 speed uh manual transmission i mean way old school what's your take on all that chris uh, are you geezer enough to uh, appreciate that oh of course i am jack i would love it uh, i was looking for a manual gearbox in the gti before i settled for the one that i bought but as you say, you know, the Mach 1 is such a – it's an interesting car because it's kind of a part spin special where they've gathered uh, bits and bobs from the GT350 and other performance Mustangs, and they've slapped it all together. And the outcome is more than the sum of its parts, I would say, and it's actually a very cohesive, fun car to drive. It is. It is all of that, and you summed it up better than I have, actually. Um, a lot to like about it. Uh, it has a Mustang-style interior, kind of semi-retro, although it has uh, – digital displays uh, that are useful, and the Mach 1 is uh, fairly upscale. I would not say it's extremely luxurious. I'd just say it's kind of nice, kind of premium, maybe, as opposed to uh, luxurious. It's a reasonably practical car of its type in that it has uh, 13.5 cubic feet of trunk space, uh, much better than the Camaro. It's an uh, obvious competitor. The Camaro <laughs> has laughable trunk space. Um, it also has, uh, on, the, on the modern side, uh, the sink infotainment system with a, a big, it could be as large as, uh, well, it has a 12-inch digital instrument cluster and then a big screen uh, for the uh, touchscreen as well. So uh, that's very modern. And a, a lot of modern safety features as well. I think there's a nice combination of the modern with his, what is essentially a very retro car. How long do you think Mustang can hold out? It's the only car, really, aside from the Ford GT, now offered by Ford Motor Company, which is amazing in itself. Uh, the, co uh, the company, the Model T, only has one or two cars, one volume car. What's your take on all of that? You know, I think we'll see some evolution of the car, and I'm not going to say this as a, a certain thing, but I think we'll see an evolution of the car in the next, next year, if not then the year the year after. Uh, it's bound to be electrified in some way, either hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or maybe even full electric. Uh, but I don't see a world, and maybe I'm wrong. I could be. I've been many wrong many times in the past. I don't see a world where Ford just ditches the Mustang altogether, even if there's still a Mustang Mach-E around. Yeah, they, uh, there is the Mustang name, uh, name on the Mach-E. Some people think that's a travesty. Others are very excited by that and, and feel that it represents Mustang well. And uh, I, I kind of fall in the middle on that. I, I don't know that I have strong feelings one way or the other. I think it, if it helps people buy an electric vehicle to think it's a Mustang, well, God bless them for that. And um, if others are upset about it, well, they can buy a regular Mustang because it's very cool. A lot of great choices out there. I like the one I was driving about 55 grand for a Mustang <laughs> has me laughing. This old guy is laughing about that. But uh, 
uh, it's a, a value even at that price. I agree. And when we come back, which we intend to do, we will be speaking with Maria Angelides. She is the chief financial officer for Automotive Mastermind, and she'll tell us how to mastermind our way into buying a car, as Chris Teague did uh, very recently. So stay with us for that right here on America on the Road. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road. Jackie Red, Jackie. We have a terrific guest for you, a really interesting guest, Marina Angelides is the chief financial officer for a company called Automotive Mastermind. I think we've talked to folks from Automotive Mastermind before. Uh, And I'll let her describe what they do. Uh, Let me preface it by saying they help dealers make more money by understanding the consumer better. And Marina, thanks so much for being with us, number one. And number two, tell us about Automotive Mastermind. Yeah, um, thanks for having me here, Jack. I'm really excited. Um, and I, I'm really excited to talk about Mastermind and what we do and what we and how we help um, not just the dealerships in their endeavors, but also the consumer at the end, um, because we want to make sure that we're finding the right customer at the right time and the right place. Um, and that means that making sure that we get the consumers the right offer and the right incentive for what they need. Um, and that's based on a whole bunch of data that we have. Um, and history and trending um, for that specific customer. So um, hopefully uh, you can see through the next 15 minutes or so um, the information that we have and how useful it is, not just to the dealerships and the industry, but also hopefully to the consumer. I mean, when that matches up, when the dealer's expectations and the consumer expectations match up well, uh, everything goes really well. Uh, and when they don't, everything <laughs> really goes, uh, you know, may, may go off the rails. So uh, right. tell us a bit about the information that uh, you gather and how this helps uh, make that match really work well. Yeah. So um, so one of the things that we do is first we have a connection with the dealer and their history. Um, and so we have a little bit of information just at the at the consumer, um, particularly their loyalty base, their service drive, those consumers that have already been a part of their ecosystem. Um, but then even further to that, we have all of this external data, this really great data around inventory and supply chain and forecasting at a macro level and on an operating manufacturer level that can help connect the points um, and you know particularly on incentives and um, you know, other programs that are being rolled out at the operating manufacturer level that could be beneficial for not just the dealer, but for the consumer in the end. This is a really challenging time, I think, all the way around. It's challenging for consumers. There's very little uh, new car inventory or much less new car inventory than we're used to. Uh, at the same time, that doesn't help dealers. <laughs> they want to they want to sell cars, right? So the more inventory okay. they have up to a point, uh, they're in pretty good shape. Tell us uh, uh, what's going on right now uh, from your point of view and, and what you've seen from the data and, and what that implies to you. Yeah, so um, all of the data points to um, some really key points. So I'll just start to just give everybody a little bit of a history for those people that are just listening in for the first time. But um, the automotive market is experiencing some unprecedented period where demand is consistently um, outweighing the supply. So new vehicle productions have declined about 20 percent year over year in 2020 just due to the pandemic alone. And then followed by that because of the supply chain impact, um, the, the chip shortage quick, quickly followed. And that really took hold in uh, spring of 2021. So that left production levels pretty flat on a year over year basis. Um, while you know coming out of COVID, the, the demand kind of rebounded, right? And so therefore high demand, uh, low supply, obviously um, we're seeing increased prices on whatever new inventory is out there, out there, but also um, in the used vehicle supply. So, so the used vehicle supply is getting hit by both ends, right? Um, one being not having the new inventory there for trade-ins or off-lease, um, and then also not having the new inventory there. So, both new and used vehicle pricing is now at new heights, um, and that is impacting the dealer at the highest profitability levels that we've seen. So that's just the the history of where we get to today. And what we've seen over the past couple of months is that inventory levels really have largely stabilized. Um, 
you know, they're roughly at a third of where they were a year ago. And we've seen a modest improvement in new vehicle inventory since actually around October of 2021. So um, it's interesting if you start to look and analyze the data, um, much of the luxury brands actually declined slightly less than mainstream counterparts. Um, and you're going to start to see some changes in the operating manufacturer behavior of how they go about, you know, the supply chain and how they're um, and how they're planned to forecast their increase in inventory in 2021 and 2022 and beyond. So, um, as an example, GM and VW, I think, recently announced that they're going to make an effort to Im- improve their supply chain um, by directly going and creating manufacturing plants versus um, using the supply chain that they historically have used. So. Um, it's not surprising um, that the that the retail sales in 2021 also accounted for the premium brands because of that production um, that was slightly less impacted at the luxury level. So, um, and we're forecasting that in 2022 there's about a 17% increase relative to 2021 of light vehicle production sales. Um, so that that production increase is obviously going to impact sales. Um, and so we're expecting a 3 to 4% improvement in, in U.S. sales as well. So um, I, think I, I think I hit all aspects of your question. You really but... did. You hit more <laughs> aspects of my question than I even thought would be there. So I appreciate that. If you were, you know, knowing what you know, what would you recommend to the typical consumer out there right now who is thinking about buying a, a newer used car and not quite sure, is this a time to jump off the pier and start swimming or is this a time to sit back and wait a little bit? Or, you know, what's your advice based on um, just what, what the data is telling you? Yeah, I mean, I think um, consumers are going to realize, right, that the inventory challenges that are out there are going to continue. Um, I think at first we saw a a step back and a reduction of trade-ins. Um, and I think now we're starting to see an increase in pre-orders, reservation touch points. Um, more OEMs and dealers are realizing that getting ahead of the curve is just as important as what they're actually doing today. And that being short-sighted in this inventory environment is gonna create challenges down the line for them um, as production maintains its current levels uh, throughout 2022. So. Um, So the dealerships will focus on the service drive um, at high on trade ends. This is an opportunity for consumers um, to consider selling their vehicles. Um, You know, vehicle acquisition right now at the dealership level is at an all time high. Um, There's lucrative trade in opportunities for the consumer. Well, is it lucrative trade in opportunities or is it a good time to sell, but not necessarily a good time to buy? I think that's what a lot of people are scratching their heads over right now. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a trade-off, right? Um, I think there is a there is a whole bunch that's happening in the market around vehicle acquisition. Um, there's also going to be some captive loan um, improvements that I think for the consumer in the end um, will be very, very beneficial right now. Um, I think that the days of instant gratification are all but gone, right? Um, many in, in market today will, make, will wait months to take a delivery. So the pre-ordering and the reservation, I think, is going to be something that is more prominent for consumers um, once they start to realize that this is not a challenge that's going to go away, um, you know, in the environment that we're in. Um, I think that the original, like the sticker shock um, with prices at all-time highs is going to be offset by the the equity position that those um, consumers will be in, and and I think that um, you know the, the so basically what you're saying is that the the value of the person's trade in car has gone up commensurately at least with the you know kind of the increase of new car prices, so it kind of a net right. evening out, right? Right, especially for those folks that have been loyal to the service drive and that you know maintain their vehicles, like their their value um, in market right now for for their vehicle is is really at an all time high. So they're actually in the best position right now to do the um, the appropriate trade in. So th- those should be really considered for themselves, um, you know, more than some of the other folks that maybe are not in a position to uh, where they just came off lease and they don't have full equity in their vehicle, right? That's a different situation. Right. Some people suggest that uh, the current, uh, the way the market is working now, and as you mentioned, a lot of people ordering cars, maybe because they have to, not because they want to, and then waiting to take delivery for weeks or months 
for the vehicle. That will become the norm going forward. I'm a little skeptical about that. I, th I think when there's more supply, and there will be more supply, because the, the basic situation with the car industry is oversupply and has always been, probably as long as you've been in the industry. Um, yep. right. And so give us your, your thoughts on that, on ordering versus going back to traditional stocking of inventory and, and selling off the lot. Yeah, I mean, I think that's all dependent on the turn in the supply chain and how operating manufacturers will behave. So for us, like some of the leading indicators um, that we'll be monitoring is, you know, firstly, just what's happening in the environment around COVID, um, new variants, are they kept in check by vaccines? Are there other measures? That actually will have a significant impact on the supply chain recovery. So um, if that's happening, then the supply chain will, will turn more quickly and inventory levels will, will start to increase. And I do think that in, in general, in the industry, um, operating manufacturers will want to get back to that high level of turnover, right? Like, um, you know, uh, in the 90, 100, 110, whereas right now we're seeing a consistent stabilization at 60, 70 day turn. So, um, and that's increased, right, since um, probably Q3 or Q4 of 2021. So I think that there's so there's definitely progress there. I do think that it will turn, um, but I also think that there's other avenues, right, that dealerships are going to have to address um, and consumers are considering, right? There's um, there's the consideration of digital retailing and how that is impacting the market and the age of convenience and the age of technology. And um, again, the the instant gratification, I think, is, has got to be um, addressed somehow right in this generation. So I think the next step for dealerships as well as consumers will be in the digital retail world. Well, one of the promises of digital retailing, right, is this thing shows up on your doorstep the next day. Uh, it doesn't show up four months from now, uh, you know, as it would if you were ordering a car that way. I mean, what do you think that would do uh, to digital, the progress that we're seeing in digital retailing? Um, again, the promise being, hey, I can do all this online and then the car shows up and I'm happy. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think that from a consumer perspective, it satisfies their needs. I think that there's still some growth and learning in the industry. It is a new industry, right? Um, and so uh, brick and mortar has had its process in place for a very, very long time um, and has built a, a stability for the consumer in that. Whereas I think there will be some learning curves in digital retailing. And so um, some of the more um, entrepreneurial consumers will will likely take advantage of it and then kind of reap the impact of the, the new industry. So um, what I think is most prominent is the connection between the dealer and a potential dig digital retailer like a Gubagoo or a Carnow, right? Where um, I think that they get the best of both worlds in that they get the support, the customer support and the uh, the customer service of a brick and mortar dealer while getting the maintenance of um, and the and the instant gratification of the the digital retailer, um, you know, car right now. Here you go. Um, so I think that, that that's going to be the evolution over time as this inventory uh, environment continues on throughout 2022. What do you think the biggest challenges are as we're summing up here, uh, Marina, uh, uh, facing the dealers and, and how will that affect consumers going forward? Um, I think the biggest challenge right now is just the actual inventory levels, right? Um, I think that if they, for whatever reason, um, start to decline again, I think um, you know, there's only so much that a consumer will reach, right, um, above MSRP. And I also think that the used car market is 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 challenging as well. It it, it has actually become more equitable to the new car to the new car market. Um, so I think seeing that will have an impact on how consumer behavior is. But I do believe that once they start to see that there is a necessity in order for um, them to actually perform the, what they want to do, right? Like a trade-in or buy a new car, that they're gonna have to do some pre-ordering or some reservation, that there's going to have to be some forward-looking behavior versus in the past where it was you just walked in and bought a car, or there's going to be an avenue down on digital retailing. It'll be one of those two avenues and the, and the dealership really um, is gonna grow over the next one to two years in providing both of those avenues for consumers. So it fits the consumer purchase um, life cycle. 
Right. Well, there were a lot of questions that remain to be answered, but uh, thanks so much for answering the ones you did. I, I got a lot of insight out of it. Marina Angelides, who is the Chief Financial o Officer at Automotive Mastermind, thanks so much for being with us. We so appreciate it. Lovely talking to you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for having me. And stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back right here on America on the Road. Welcome back to America on the Road with Christine Jackie Red with you. It is our final segment of the week. Uh, I'm always sad when we get to this segment because I love talking with Chris about cars and learning what he has to say about them from across the country. Uh, and we'd love to hear from you, too. We'd love to have your listener question. You can send it to us at uh, editor at drivingtoday.com. We'll answer it on an upcoming show. But here's a question I have for Chris right now. This is from Lynn in Santa Monica, California. Lynn asks this. Some people are saying that a vehicle subscription is a way to test an EV without buying one. Is that something I should consider? Well, I will say that vehicle subscriptions, no matter how simple they sound, are likely more complicated than you would guess. So if you're looking to try out an EV, the best thing you could do if you can find one is to try one on a dealer's lot so that you're not getting financially involved in signing up for payments or any sort of uh you know, plan that's going to take you beyond the one vehicle or for an extended period of time. You know, I think Volvo does uh, care by, is it care by Volvo is what it's called? It's something like that. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, but you end up tied into a vehicle for more than, than a little bit of time. So I don't know that that's the best choice, Jack. What do you think? Uh, I'm not a big fan of subscriptions. I guess it's certainly worth investigation, but I'm not thinking that uh, a subscription is really the, the logical choice here. And I think when people look at subscriptions like the Volvo, a care by Volvo subscription, they realize they can probably lease that vehicle uh, less expensively and, and not have the you know, kind of mental gymnastics that they go through with uh, a subscription. So anyway, I guess that's our show for this week and uh, a lot going on in the uh, Teague household with a new vehicle and a new puppy and all that. And uh, Chris, thanks so much for being with us. If you want to listen more and you want to take us wherever you go, you can hit the Sports Map Radio homepage and look at us look us up on the Saturday schedule. We're right there. It has our Apple podcast as well as a version of our uh, recorded radio podcast for you guys. Absolutely true. Our thanks to the Sports Map Radio Network stations for carrying America on the road. We do appreciate that. And most of all, we appreciate the fact that you're listening to us on America on the road. We really do appreciate that. You're the reason we do what we do. And thanks so much for being out there. It's much appreciated. And join us again next time for another edition of America on the Road. America on the Road is brought to you by Mercury Insurance and DrivingToday.com. If you're looking to save some money, you should switch to Mercury for your auto and home insurance. Californians save an average of $670 with Mercury, so imagine how much you could save. Get a quote today at MercuryInsurance.com. And if you are looking to buy a new car, a used car, or just care about cars, join us at DrivingToday.com. DrivingToday.com is the official automotive website of America on the Road. That's drivingtoday.com.